Hello and welcome to Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us for another installment of this podcast series as we continue through. In fact, today we'll be finishing the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in the 16th chapter as we round out Paul's first letter to that church in Corinth. Welcome to the journey with us. I hope this isn't your first time joining us, but if it is, hey, welcome aboard. And I'd encourage you to just pause here go back and start with the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, you'll find the discussion makes a whole lot more sense starting at the beginning. But welcome. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer as we begin this time together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for this life. We thank you for this world. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that brings us salvation through Christ that we not only stumble through this world, but we are given direction by you and purpose by you, that we were created for relationship with you, and you call us forward in that relationship. Father, help us to see, to see where this letter to the church at Corinth hits close to home in our lives, where the call that Paul resoundingly gives the church at Corinth to fall on your grace and live in obedience to you is something that is a hallmark of our life or a challenge to us where our life doesn't measure up to that. Lord, in all things, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for Christ, your living word. In his name it is we pray. Amen. Picking up in chapter 16, starting in verse 1, we're going to be looking at really Paul's conclusion to his first letter to the church at Corinth. Um, Now, he covers more territory in the second book of Corinthians, second Corinthians, but this is the rounding out, if you will, of that first letter. Remember, he was in Ephesus writing back to that church at Corinth that he had planted there some roughly three years earlier, Um, and the occasion for this writing had a whole lot to do with some guys coming from Corinth with a letter with some questions and some concerns about some disputes and some activities that were going on in the church. And Paul has spent the bulk of this book covering those points and addressing those issues. And a few of them he gives praise on, and some of them he really chastises them uh, for. He flat out says, you know, I'd love to praise you in this, but I have nothing good to say to you about this. And, you know, just really kind of makes it plain to them and calls them back to obedience to God's word and his commands. Now, as we get to 16, he's taking care of a little house cleaning here at the end. And then he rounds it out with what truly is his conclusion, his normal ending of a letter with a final benediction and, and greeting, the listing of individuals and Uh, just a a blessing to them as a church. So let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 16. He says, now regarding your questions about, so there again, he's responding to questions in letter. Now regarding your questions about money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem. Now at this time, there was hardship for the people in Jerusalem. There was famine in the area, but also uh, turning to Christ meant they were ostracized from their community in Jerusalem. Now, to think about what that means, they are cut off. Most of the, even, you know, what you would consider a local grocery store was part of the Jewish community, and they are now cut off from that. They are being persecuted. Their family connections that that used to be in place that they could rely on, they've been disowned by their families because they've turned to Christ. I mean, that they are shunned from society for being Christians, and that took away their their business opportunities, it took away their their resources, their ability to to make gainful income or purchase things. I mean, it it was a dire situation for the believers in Jerusalem. Now, this is roughly around AD 55, so we haven't seen the fall of Jerusalem yet. But the people of Christ, God's people in Jerusalem, are in need. And Paul has been taking up a collection and encouraging the the churches around Asia Minor and, and well, around the Roman Empire to 
give what they could to support, to take care of these brothers and sisters in Christ that, that they may have never met, but still they know of their suffering. And that's, this is a great message to who we should be as churches. And many churches live this out on a regular basis, supporting, um, you know, a lot of times we'll call it mission work, but supporting uh, different ministries and sister churches around the globe. Then it's a significant thing. Well, here's he's talking to them about questions they got about this collection. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I give I gave to the churches in Galatia. Okay, the province north of y'all. Um, I, I gave them guidance, and you should follow the same guidance. Here it is, verse two. On the first day of each week, you should you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I'll write letters of recommendation for the messengers that you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. Now, he's making it real clear there's some accountability here. This isn't a, hey, take up a bunch of money and give it to me. I'll take care of it. I mean, I think they trust Paul, although we see from the letter there are some that do not trust Paul and do not listen to Paul. In fact, they're speaking out against Paul. And Paul is saying, look, here's what it's about. It's about God leading you to set apart some of what you have to help those that do not have. Now, the recommendation I'm giving you, same recommendation I've given to all the churches in Galatia, that is very simply, hey, pick a day a week and set apart on that day a portion. He doesn't even stipulate what the portion is, although elsewhere he encourages giving generously. Um, I've had people say, well, what are we supposed to give? Are we supposed to give 10%? You know... We talk about a tithe. Tithe literally means tenth. So yeah, that's not a bad goal. But over and over in Scripture, what we see is more than that. Even the mandated Old Testament offerings, the time we figure out the temple offerings and the first fruit offerings and the, everything else, I, I've heard different accounts, but it varies between roughly 23% up to about 30%. Well, that's a bit more than 10%, isn't it? And that's Old Testament. We get New Testament. I mean, if you want to be pretty rigid about this and say, well, if he if he is saying, and I'm not saying he is, but if he is saying, pick one day a week and set aside a portion of the money you have earned, uh, if he's saying set aside that day's portion, then that's a seventh, isn't it? One of seven days, you know, or, or even a sixth if you only work six. I mean, that's, that's a pretty sizable amount. But see, we shouldn't get hung up on, well, what percentage is it supposed to be? And then, is that the gross or the net? Well, what about this? Well, what if what if I tithed on my retirement investment going in, and then I take it out? Do I have to tithe again? And do we... Folks, don't fall into the trap of legalism, that you got to check the boxes, that you get... Go with the conviction of your heart. What is God impressing on your heart? There are some guidelines, some some uh, boundary markers along the way that are given to us in God's word, much like Paul saying, look, here's the direction I gave, the procedure that I gave for the churches in Galatia. It's a good practice. It's a good guideline for you. Now, give. Set aside a portion of what you've earned. You don't have to wait till somebody shows up to collect it. Just do it on a regular basis. And then when somebody shows up to collect it, Boom, there it is. It's not scrambling to get it together. It, it does require some discipline in handling of money, but that's not a bad thing. And then he's saying, not only don't wait till I get there, he says, when I come, I'll write a letter of recommendation. You know, I'll, I'll write the letter for the group back in Jerusalem so they know who it's coming from and that this is a legit offering. And then you can choose the messengers that you want to deliver it. He's not saying, I'll take it. Trust me with it. He's saying, 
you pick the people you consider responsible to see that he gets there. And uh, if it's appropriate, I'll go with them. They can be my traveling companion. But there's a real practicality to this. And much of what God calls us to in our Christian generosity does involve a certain level of practicality. It also involves us having a generous spirit, us being willing to say, you know, what I have is not mine. It belongs to the Lord, and I want to use it in a way that honors him and that is a blessing to others. So how can I do that? And prayerfully seeking out. Uh, if you're taking pride in going, well, I tithe 10% constantly, or I tithe 15%, or, you know, whatever, and that becomes a point of pride for you, there's a problem. Now, if whatever you're giving, you say, I think God wants me to give more, then work towards that. Be faithful to what God is impressing on your heart. Should we all give on a regular basis? Yes. Should we give in support of the Lord's work? Yes. Should we give generously out of the abundance that God has blessed us with? Yes. Yeah, we should. And here Paul is just giving them some guidelines to help them in that process. Now, in all fairness, Paul isn't specifically talking about tithes to support the, the ministry of the church and its ongoing operation. Instead, he is, in fact, talking about a special offering uh, to be taken up and given to help those in Jerusalem. But the principles of Christian generosity and our understanding of stewardship are tied in with both of those concepts. So uh, there we go. Now, picking up in verse 5, he's shifting more into giving his final instructions as part of the conclusion of his letter. Here's what he says. I'm coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia. So he's going up to the, the northern part of Greece there uh, before he comes down to Corinth. And he's kind of retracing previous missionary steps. He says, so I'm coming to visit you after I've been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter. And then you can send me on my way to my next destination. This time, I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. That would be May or June. So he's looking timeline, May or June, he's going to be in Ephesus, and then he's going to head up around to Macedonia and then work his way down and get to Corinth, uh, winter time, winter there in Corinth. He goes on in verse 9, there's a wide open door for great work here, although many opposed me, and there was opposition there in Ephesus. But he's pointing out, hey, you know, God's at work everywhere. Not only in Corinth, not only in Macedonia, but he's also at work right here in Ephesus, where I am now. So I'm going to be here until this point, Lord will, you know, if, if the Lord will let me. Then we get to verse 10. He says, when Timothy comes, so he's sending Timothy, and presumably sending Timothy with his letter. Uh, he's sending Timothy, and there's indications here, and also in the letters to Timothy, that Timothy Paul's son in the ministry, Timothy, is grounded. Paul has discipled Timothy, and now Timothy is a co-worker with Paul in ministry. Uh, but there seems to be indication that, personality-wise, Timothy may be a little shy, you know, and he encourages them. He says, when Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He is doing the Lord's work, just as I am. Don't let anyone treat him with contempt. Send him on his way with your blessing when he returns to me i expect him to come with the other believers so he's kind of he's giving them a warning here uh not not necessarily carrot and stick but he's, he's saying hey look this is not going to be acceptable this is how you're going to behave towards timothy you're going to show him the proper respect you are going to treat him as one who is doing the lord's work just like me do not treat him with contempt 
and when you send him to come back to me, you're going to send him with your blessing. Um, now, it's kind of sad that he has to give that kind of instruction to the Church of Corinth, but I mean, go back and read the rest of the book. I, it's, <laughs> he's had to give a lot of instruction that's kind of sad he had to give to the Church of Corinth. But how human is that? How human is it to categorize people by their temperament um, instead of looking at them from a godly perspective and seeing their value and worth as a person, especially a person who is serving the Lord and doing his work. Uh, we all have differing opinions. We all have different styles. We all have different personalities. That doesn't make one better than the other. It just makes them different. And God is at work through each one of them that is in his service. We need to acknowledge that. We need to have the grace and the submissiveness to acknowledge that. We're going on in verse 12. He says, now about my brother Apollos. Now, you may remember Apollos from some of the early chapters, you know. I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollo. You know, and he had to deal with all that. Apollos is not a bad guy, okay? The Corinthians were uh, twisting things around, but Apollos, um, we don't have scripture from Apollos, but we have references to Apollos and some church history as well. Uh, Apollos was, was a well-spoken um, apologeticist. Uh, he he defended the faith, and he did missionary work around the Mediterranean contemporary with Paul, and, and God used him in great ways, so no slight here at all. Paul says, now about our brother Apollos, I urged him to visit you with the other believers, but he was not willing to go right now. Hmm. Yeah, that does harken back to the beginning of the letter where people were trying to draw that division. He was like, hey, I talked to Apollos, and I said, hey, why don't you go? And he said, no, that's not, um, that's, that's not what I need to do right now. He's not willing to go right now. He will see you later when he has the opportunity. So when the schedule opens up, when he has the opportunity to be there, he'll be there. Verse 13, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. Wow. So he's talking about individuals, and then he just stops and throws in verses 13 and 14. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. He just kind of gave us a two-verse outline of the whole book, didn't he? Hitting the high points. About being on our guard against false teaching, about standing firm in the faith, even if we're alone in that. About being courageous to, to stand with Christ. About being strong, grounded in his word, and doing everything that we do with love. Remind you of chapter 13, maybe. And then 15 picks up with, you know that, I'm going to butcher these names, I'm sorry. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece. And they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I am very glad that Stephanus Fortunatus, and, oh wow, Nicacus, uh, have come here. So he's saying, hey, here are these leaders of the church in Greece, and they serve you. These seem to be the guys that got sent over to Ephesus with the letter and questions for Paul to respond to, because he's talking about them being here. Um, he says, they have been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They've they have been you 
in your stead is essentially what he's saying. They've represented you here in my presence. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show appreciation to all who serve well. So so you need to appreciate these people. Now, that brings him to, uh, if you will, a conclusion of talking about their questions, talking about individuals that have come there, people he's planning to send there. Now he's going to shift into what for Paul is the standard close for his letter. He's going to talk about the, the greetings being sent from where he is, and he's going to list some of the believers that are there that maybe names they would know um, or, or people that he thinks deserve recognition um, there. And then he's going to shift into giving his, if you will, benediction, his blessing there at the close. And there are a couple things we'll point out about that. So let's get ready to look at verse 19 and following. In 19, he says, the churches here in the province of Asia. See, when we talk about the churches of Asia Minor, it's, it's the whole area over there. And Paul's saying, hey, you know, Ephesus seems to be a hub of that, but it's not the only church there. This is the churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla, and the others who gather in their home for church meetings. Now, there's a couple of important things there. One, that reference to Aquila and Priscilla. Why would he mention them by name? Well, because they were significant in the ministry there in Ephesus. They were also significant in ministry with Paul. We see them later when Paul was imprisoned in Rome, being in Rome. Uh, they were merchants. Uh, they worked hand in hand or side by side with Paul on numerous occasions. They were believers. They were also from Corinth. Yeah, they were from Corinth. So... You know that they send their greetings that's a, a pretty big deal writing back to people many of which they may have known so they send greetings in the lord the churches send greetings in the lord as do aquila and priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings that would have been similar to what was happening at corinth and now that Priscilla and Aquila are in Ephesus, those meetings are happening there. And you may go, see, house church. It's all about house churches. Well, you know, uh, yeah, it was because that's where they had to meet. That and other places. But uh, before you start thinking, oh, they were just gathering in the living room and it's, you know, a dozen people or so because that's what would fit. Some of these houses, uh, archaeologists have, have unearthed. Uh, some of these houses and the architecture, and they could be rather large, and they had open courtyards, many of them, uh, open air, open courtyards in the middle of them. Uh, kind of think uh, Spanish hacienda type thing. Some of these houses, you could fit a couple hundred people for a gathering in if you needed to. So don't just go, oh, they were meeting in homes. There were only eight or 12 of them. Uh, there could be a significant number. So don't let that misconception of maybe what your living room looks like uh, dictate how you're conceptualizing this. But they were taking what they had and they were opening it up for believers to gather. And all those believers that gather in their home for church meetings send their greetings as well. Verse 20, all the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with Christian love, or literally it says with a, with a holy kiss. Um, the New Living Translation says with Christian love because the symbolism of the kiss is Christian love. It helps us understand culturally and in our modern context. But it would have been understood there in that first century world, especially coming out of kind of a Jewish background, but Mediterranean background. The believers would have kissed each other on the cheek when greeting as a, a sign of recognition and a sign of belonging and a sign of love for each other. Um, you know, does that mean we're doing it wrong when we have church and we don't, you know, kiss everybody on the cheek when we walk in the door? No, because that's not our culture and it doesn't have that same connection. Um, so that's why New Living translates it that way. 
is to get the intent across without limiting to the specific physical action. So it's better to teach the the principle behind it instead of just the um, activity, if that makes sense. So uh, don't just start thinking, oh, it's a bad translation. They're playing loose and free with it. They're not literally translating the Greek, but they're helping you understand the concept behind what the Greek is saying. So it's it's not so bad. All right. Now we make it to just the last few verses, actually the last four verses. After he tells them you should greet each other in Christian love, he says these words, verse 21, Here is my greeting in my own handwriting. Now, why is that significant? He says, Paul. That's, that's his great Paul. Why is that significant? Well, Paul used scribes, secretaries, amanuensis, whatever term you want to use. He used people that he would dictate the information to, and they would craft the letter. Now, what level of crafting did they do with the letter? Was, was they just writing down just what Paul said to write, or did he tell them concepts and they penned it out? There's some debate over that, but really, does it matter if it's all inspired by God, it's God's word, then, you know, whether it's mouth of Paul through somebody's ear into the paper or from Paul's hand, it's not really that important. So he sends his greetings and he says, I'm going to do this in my own handwriting. And he signed, he personally signs the letter, Paul. He says, if anyone does not love the Lord... That person is cursed. Our Lord, come. Now, it seems to be, because it appears in many of the early Christian writings, that our Lord, come was a, a common prayer, a common refrain among the early church. They were looking and longing as we should be as well for the return of Christ. And so that was often an expression that was used as part of prayer, as part of petition before God. And Paul starts that verse with giving a warning. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. He's not saying, I curse that person. He's saying, look, if you do not love the Lord, you are still under the curse of sin. You have not received God's grace and forgiveness because you've rejected it. So you are choosing to live under the curse. You are cursed. That's the reality. Now, I can imagine... Someone who didn't acknowledge Christ may read that, although I don't know why they would be reading the Christian scriptures, but they read that and go, oh, God, I, he's pronouncing a curse on me. I can't believe that. No, he's describing your condition and letting you know it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so there it is. Verse 23. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. The theme of grace has permeated this letter to the Corinthian church. Paul started at the very beginning of his letter talking about the grace of Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus. And now he bookends it to bring it all back around to ending the grace of the Lord Jesus. May it be with you. And then verse 24, my love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Saying, look, in Jesus, I love you guys. None of what Paul has said in his letter has he said intending to be harsh. None of it has he said intending to tear people down. All of it has been inspired by God. He's been moved to write all of this in his letter. For their building up because he loves them in Christ. And he's been trying to teach them what it looks like to live out that love of Christ towards others. And so that's how he finishes his letter, referencing the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love. That he has for them in Christ Jesus. And that concludes his letter.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you. Lord, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus. We pray that you would use us to make that grace known to more and more. And Father, we thank you for the love that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would help us to live out that love in ever more effective ways. To make you known, to show your love, your grace to a people that are hungry for it, even if they don't know it. Help us to be faithful servants of yours, bringing glory to your name. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.